How are you, Chris? Good, how are you? Very good, very good. So, where are you? I'm in Minneapolis. Minneapolis, yeah. My wife's from Wisconsin, not really close, but closer than us. We're out in California, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, thanks for reaching out. Uh, look forward to talking today. So, uh, I'll, I'll let you ask the questions and see wherever you want to take it, and, uh, and we'll enjoy ourselves. So, it sounds pretty good? Yeah. Good. So I can just start from the beginning. Um, obviously, yeah. obviously you studied at Juilliard, and did you just move to LA like right after you graduated? Yes, as a matter of fact, um, I, I came out uh, from New York. I met a in the, the uh, actually in my first year at Juilliard, I met uh, an agent. I mean, it really was a type of uh, you know just fortuitous story because. Um, I was uh, living at the Hotel Olcott on 77th Street with a couple of roommates. And uh, this woman said, do, do you, uh, are you an actor? And I said, well, yes, you know, how did she know I was a Juilliard? I had not. But she then said uh, that she was an agent and I met with her and she sent me out on a few things out in California when I went back home for the, uh, for the summer. Mm -hmm. And I really liked it. And then um, I, had, I made plans with her that I'd, finished my second year and then I'd come out to LA and that's what I did and her name was Mel Mary Ellen White and she was a wonderful first almost like a second mother so she was really uh, uh, she was very protective which is great for a young actor because a lot of people uh, want a lot of things from you so uh, mm -hmm. but she was great yeah and the, the first role would have been in the Cloris Leachman show Phyllis Phyllis, yes, that was the, uh, uh, and it was funny because at, at Juilliard, of course, you're, 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 it's theatrical training, especially in those days, which was what they call, what we call mid-Atlantic speech, which is mother, father, sister, brother. It's sort of a neither American or, or English. It's sort of in between. And I remember I was auditioning and, and, and one, one casting director helped me understand what I was doing wrong. She goes, Lee, where did you study acting? And I thought, oh, I, I think I'm coming off a little, a little false. And essentially, the next audition, I, I played as normal as I could, and that was Phyllis. And uh, it was with Cloris Leachman, and uh, it was a it was a, a, a three camera sitcom mm -hmm. directed by quite a quite a well known director, Jay Sandridge, whose father was uh, another director of a lot of the uh, '40s films. And uh, that was that was kind of fun because that was like doing theater. It was like doing it live. As a matter of fact, I dropped my lines when I was doing that show, and I remember I started improvising as you would in a stage show oh, <laughs> until you get back on track. And, and the director goes, "No, no, 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 Lee. We we can we can stop the camera and begin again." So, a lot of those uh, early mistakes were quite fun. <laughs> Looking back, at the time, rather embarrassing. Mm -hmm. And what, what what was it like for you to work with her? Of course. You know, Cloris, I really enjoyed uh, 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 Cloris. And it was interesting because she had gotten to know me. And I think just because I was a young, good looking actor and, you know, you, you have a lot of assumptions, especially as an older actor. Uh, and uh, and she did. But I, I, I had become friends with her, her son, I think it was, um, and had very serious conversations. And so he started talking about our conversations with her. And by the end of the show, it was very interesting. And it was a shift toward uh, her seeing me more, essentially. So uh, it, it, was, it was a nice transition. It was, you know, really about that, that uh, element of, of substantiveness, essentially, you know, having something to talk about other than me. <laughs> and the same year you would have been on uh, Streets of San Francisco, too. Yeah, that, that's where actually I met my <clears throat> first uh, roommate, who was a young actor, Scott Columbia, who did, uh, oh, he did Groundhog Day, not Groundhog Day, um, the Bill Murray, um, was it, it, it's about the gopher, I just, I'm oh, Caddyshack, sure. Caddyshack, thank you, <laughs> yeah, there goes my film trivia award, um, no, but uh, Caddyshack, and other things. And Scott and I uh, played uh, young, uh, we were high school students on the streets of San Francisco. It was my third show. And it was with, of course, the venerable Carl Malden and the young Michael Douglas. 
And um, uh, I, I still remember, I, I, I had the line, Bobby stole the watch and put it in the locker, and you know it as well as I do. And I came in and said, Bobby stole the locker from that watch, and you know it as well as I. And I, when your brain starts inverting words because you're nervous, it's your third show, Mm -hmm. uh, 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 it, uh, well, it, it became memorable. Usually you can forget entire characters you've played and some, something shows up and you think, that's me, I did that. Um, uh, but the early stuff where you're uh, uh, learning the ropes is, is kind of fun. But uh, Michael Douglas was uh, great. Carl Malden was very funny. And, uh, and I met Scott Columbia. And then we, uh, we roomed together in Beverly Hills and then up in... Uh, Gosh, off sunset. But then uh, met my to-be wife, Carla, and uh, we moved to Westwood. And then we moved out here 40 years ago now. Oh, yeah. Awesome. yeah. Times have passed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, streets of San Francisco. And and um, and what what was uh, after that? I think like medical center. I it was rather fun. I, I played a a Russian sailor, so I had to speak Russian. And Theodore Bikel, who was an extraordinary performer, played my father. And, um, uh, and then uh, because of that, I, I actually met the uh, director, George Cukor. And there was the possibility of doing a film with him, but the timing never worked out. But it was an extraordinary opportunity uh, to speak with uh, a director that now is the stuff of legend. But, uh, you know, I was, I was up at his place and... He talked about actors. He talked about how he really didn't like the new crop. He really liked my performance. And he said it reminded him of the old actors because he said, you just, you just uh, gave the performance. You weren't self-indulgent. He thought at the time that he go, went through Dustin Hoffman and Al Pacino. And, and he felt that a lot of the contemporary actors had become more interested in themselves than in... in and when, it's interesting when you look at, let's say... Uh, the Big Sleep with Humphrey Bogart and at the end when he's really doing this sort of a uh, narrative to explain the film. But it's coming out of him like a machine gun. You know, he's not stopping to emote. He's not stop and it's a different type of effectiveness. And as a matter of fact, when uh, um, the, uh, the director, uh, gosh, Psycho, I'm just blanking on who, who he played Psycho. He's uh, Anthony Perkins. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Anthony Perkins, uh, when I did Lucky Stiff uh, with him, I remember he he watched uh, two actors. It was very interesting, and he and he he was very attentive. And then he said, "Okay, now do it twice as fast." And all the sort of things fell away, and and it was very crisp, very much like something you'd see in in the crisp dialogue of of a, of a '40s film or '50s film. So very interesting, and. Um, uh, yeah, so that so that was, uh, and then that le led to my first series executive suite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. Well, that that was that was uh, seventy five. Uh, we did uh, we did the pilot uh, at the end of I think nineteen seventy five, which is really the year I began uh, professionally. I was twenty years old, and. Um, I was replacing uh, an actor on the show because he was, Sharon Acker was my mom and uh, uh, on the show. And I guess he looked too much like her lover than her son. And, uh, but, but I had the great, uh, really great fortune to work with Mitch Ryan, who uh, played my father, who, as I said, like a deep oar in the water. If you're feeling lost, he just, he had great suggestions and he'd look at him and he'd be a, a really sort of riveting force. And I learned a lot from him, not uh, just by, by that feeling of presence and, and how important that was. But, but uh, we did executive suite and it was very cutting edge. It was the first open-ended uh, serial uh, in nighttime uh, soap, essentially. Uh, and uh, Walt um, uh, Paley, uh, the head of the network was very, very big on it. And so we, we had, uh, and in the 70s, there was much more uh, challenging of what became sort of, uh, I don't know, just became glossed over because in the 70s, from 75 to 80, uh, like an executive suite, I had a black 
uh, girlfriend played by Brenda Sykes. So there was an interracial relationship. My sister was like uh, Patty Hearst, Wendy Phillips, and she had had been uh, seduced by, you know, uh, the need for revolution. Uh, my father was an industrial, who was, of course, his executive suite based on the movie. And, uh, you know, and I, I was uh, your, your sort of prodigal son. And uh, there were a lot of elements that, that went into the show, but it just, it seemed to be just because it predated Dallas by a year, I think. But we were up against, it was Monday night football in, in, in those days or Friday night football and whatever it was, we were opposite that. Oh. So they moved us because they believed in the show, but then we were opposite the first airing of Roots. And that, that miniseries was off the charts in terms of viewing. So it seemed like everything we tried to do to position it just didn't work out. And we did 21 shows, but the, the grace for me was that uh, I met Carla, uh, who was uh, a, a trainee uh, from the uh, director's training program. And she was one of eight uh, out of thousands that had applied uh, to become uh, an assistant director. But you go through 400 days as a trainee and it's grueling, no pay, basically uh, like an intern slave labor. But uh, we met and I, I, I found her so beautiful and so fascinating, but uh, I, I thought she'd have nothing to do with me. I didn't really take myself as seriously as many of the characters I played. So I, I, uh, I remember I, I said, would you you know, consider going out with me. And, and she said, yes. And the, the rest is, is destiny because it's, she is the, what I really feel is the being that uh, healed my soul that brought, cause we have daughters and now a granddaughter and, yep. and uh, it brought the other side of things that make uh, life far more meaningful than the pursuit of a, a career. And you can look back at your career and think of it more like a, you know, a walk in the park or a walk in the mountains you went through and, you know, but the great grace is the people you meet along the way. Right. And and you got at the same time also you had uh, Rich Man Poor Man. Oh yes, Rich Man Poor Man. That was that was uh, really and it's funny. Speaking of Carla, she saw me on that before we actually met. Oh. Okay. Um, and and uh, she she uh, would remind me that that there was just something about me, but. Uh, but it seemed to have that effect. Peter Strauss played my father, and Susan Blakely, who was always, you know, all of maybe uh, five years older than me, uh, played my mom. Uh, and I played uh, uh, Billy Abbott, who was, uh, in a way, an angst-ridden uh, young person that, that had nihilistic tendencies and a lot of sardonic uh, sadness about him so but it was a very effective uh, character it was very uh and it impressed uh, some people that they said you know he's not just a pretty face this guy can act so that was good and it led to it opened a lot of doors in, in that because it was a um it, it was something that that i didn't i didn't uh, especially in the early days i really did uh, try to craft whatever character i was given i tried to make something of it you know make interesting choices what was it like? Did you um, interact much with Nick Nolte? You know, it's interesting with Nick. I didn't work with him then, but he's a neighbor. And um, I haven't seen him in a number of years now, but um, uh, because of, he had a fire at his place. Uh, but, but we used to go over and they'd do uh, drumming and getting together and had a, had a very nice community of people uh, that uh, he would gather. And he's an extraordinary man. I mean, a real uh, polymath of talent. He, he does... Uh, everything from blowing glass to you know uh, just just an outpouring of of, of creativity. So, uh, but I didn't I didn't actually work with him on the show, and I only met him in later years as as a friend. And uh, he is a person that that uh, is is very admirable and uh, lives about two miles from here, <laughs> mm. which which is good. Hello, Nick. <laughs> and then at that same time too, you were in the both of the. Uh, teenage Runaway portrait? Yeah, those actually had a, a, a very, they were very, very important to uh, my career because they, uh, they were, again, uh, dealing with uh, uh, child prostitution, meaning hustlers and, uh, and underage uh, uh, runaways. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, as I said in the 70s, like having an interracial uh, relationship, it seemed as though we were trying, or I should say the producers, the, the, they were going much more into the underbelly, trying to get at uh, social problems. And um, they held auditions, uh, really just, they, they were looking and looking and looking uh, for this character, Alexander. Uh, and Eve Plum, who was on the Brady Bunch, played, uh, I think it was Jan, uh, she was uh, Dawn, uh, yep. the runaway, little runaway girl. And Alexander uh, was her, uh, would become her protector uh, and friend. Uh, but really, she became uh, essentially an ideal because he was so uh, desperately, um, in a way, um, left alone. And uh, the second movie, Alexander, The Other Side of Dawn, uh, really explored uh, the gay uh, community of, uh, you know, the, at, at Studio 54 and had a compassionate look. I, I felt that uh, for what it was, it tried to do, um, you know, to create a human portrait. That was my goal as an actor, uh, was to really flesh out Alexander as as you know, because people said, "Well, was he gay? Was he?" You know, and it was. It was. Uh, you know, I, I said that that he was really. You know, I don't. I don't think one can declare that if if it is really that feeling of I just need to be loved. I need to love something. Mm -hmm. You know, this world has no love in it. It. it you know, it, it. It is so dreadful, and and that's why I felt that that it was more about the idealization of dawn. You know, of, of having something like like a star that that maybe you can lift this you know us out of this dreadfulness and we'll be about this not, not this so it was it was very good and that did that also opened uh, many doors it, it uh, um it was it was very good uh, in terms of how it was received for the most part i, I mean there were certain things that you read reviews and you think huh <laughs> i don't think they realize there's a human being on the other side of that review but that's <laughs> If you can't take that, you probably shouldn't be in the in the in the business, so to speak. Was that a uh, in like involved emotional process to get yourself in the headspace of Alexander? Yeah, I mean, I really um, uh, we we even um, did a hidden camera up and up in uh, Selma and Hollywood Boulevard and the Gold oh. Cup, which is where the hustlers hung out. And it was so eye opening for me. And, and I really, uh, you know, because I was a kid that grew up in Malibu, I was mostly, in, you know, which was more rural. It wasn't a bunch of rich kids. It was really about horses and trails mm -hmm. and, you know, being near nature. And and, and so, so um, you know, and I, 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 when I lived in New York and, and then, you know, you, you, you grow up a lot. But then when I, I did that film, um, I, I, it just opened up worlds. I, I had no idea existed. And I talked with uh, young guys and just just my my heart was like wow I mean you 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 just have no idea how unutterably difficult life is for you know so many kids that are told that you know I hate you get out of the house you know get out of here and mm -hmm. you know what do you do and and I learned a lot and I and I think it was it was that feeling of uh, you know sort of if if I had to say anything is that that the roles that have been very different from myself have, uh, for good and for ill, like with Alexander for good, and then with Damian Smith, who played, was a very w wicked type of character, they both broadened my uh, psychological sense. You know, you, f you find sort of forgiveness on both ends because you realize how people are motivated when you find how they are on the interior. Mm -hmm. you, do, you, know, you realize this character, how, how is this character broken? You know, what is he hiding? What, you know, if, if he had to live in one part of his body, where would it be type of thing? You know, those questions that activate the imagination in different ways, which is always interesting because each character comes like almost like it's an, uh, an instrument in the, in the orchestra comes from a different tuning, a different sound. And um, and, and when the characters were good, I, I, that's when I loved it as an actor. And, and the, the where I did not shine was what I called mannequin acting, which is where there really isn't anything except getting the audience from scene three to scene four and not. Do you know, in other words, you're, you're a plot continuator, but, but you don't really have a character. It's, it's more like, and then, uh, you know, and, and that's harder for an actor because there's nothing to, to hold on to. Was it fun for you, uh, you're after that being on Hawaii Five-0? Yeah, it was. I, it was, 
also being in Hawaii for the first time, uh, I, I, you know, I've grown up around uh, California and around pine trees and, and sycamore trees and been on the East Coast. So, you know, dogwoods and cottonwoods, all this. But in Hawaii, you know, I, I still remember I walked out because uh, we landed at night, it was very warm, went to the hotel and I, I walked out in the morning and I had never seen so much green in all of my life. And I realized my brain, this is where I understand that we really do have to sort of imprint something. It's, it's not the whole thing. It's almost like you just have to have a reference. And then the brain starts to like a computer, you know, build a, oh, this is, you know, this is this type of environment. And, and it was rather a, a, a still a remarkable feeling of where you're overwhelmed by the verdant nature of the place, the warmth of it, and, and just sort of this, this, this moist embrace when you get there. And then Jack Lord, it was interesting. He, uh, he took a great liking to me uh, uh, it, uh, on the show. Uh, and um, we, we actually um, took me, we I met his wife and uh, he was a photographer, showed me his uh, uh, photographs and uh, somewhere there are photographs of, of me as well. And it was completely decent and honored. There was no, there was no undertow of anything going on, which, which I, you know, I, you, you just have a certain sense about. And and it was, but it was it was it was it was a good experience. I I um, I felt uh, it's it's very nice when you're when you're a young a young actor and and an older actor says uh, you're interesting. You know, let's let's go. I want to show you because he wanted to show me. He had a he has a big big friend of Elvis Presley, and he oh, had yeah. one of his uh, you know all sequined uh, you know way back got you a kind of collar type of things and the suit, you know behind glass and. Uh, I'll never forget it. I, he just, just, he beamed with uh, sort of this, this, you know, what he thought of Elvis. It was, it was, it was memorable. I, I remember that more than uh, the, uh, um, uh, with uh, the end of it where James uh, MacArthur, that's right, um, where this aquarium, you know how the aquarium always, no matter what it is, if there's an aquarium in the shot, you know it's gonna be shot and the water's gonna come out. Well, the water was coming out and James MacArthur keeps, and I'm talking and I, and he starts giggling and he goes, and he goes, well, what? He goes, sounds like a horse is peeing behind you because the water just was pouring out. And, and then he, he said, all right, you're handcuffed. He said, he said, uh, do you think you can, and I'm, I'm, I was really limber. And, and he goes, do you think you can, uh, you, you can slip out of the handcuffs? I think, and I really thought I could. And I got, I remember I got the handcuffs down to about my, my thighs and, and, um, I, I was really glad because someone took pity on me because you can really make, I, I would suggest if anybody uh, in, let's say a party says, hey, do you think you can, don't fall for it. You can't. <laughs> and you'll find yourself in an uncomfortable position asking her, someone, uh, please, can you just pull this way and I'll, I'll, I'll lean back that way and I'll, I'll undo myself. <laughs> I do like uh, any, anybody that I'd see that was on uh... ABC after school specials. I always like asking about that too. Yeah, you know that I, I um, uh, that was Blind Sunday, and it was about a young boy who would befriends a, a, a blind girl, and he wants to know very much in his friendship with her what it is like to be blind. So he then puts uh, you know uh, puts um, gauze over his eyes and dark glasses, and they. They, they explore the world together of, uh, you know, the sightless and uh, discover worlds that uh, are seen when they are not seen. So it was, it was a lovely uh, afternoon special. I remember my mom, who was a teacher, would always show it. And, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, it was great. My mom, as, as a teacher, would find any reason to screen one of her son's films. Bless you, mom, wherever you are. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah, she was a good one. And what was the, what was the, uh, what was the TV movie about the Bermuda Triangle that you were in? Oh yes, that was that was um, that was Rank Productions, and it was Bermuda the Bermuda Depths, which, interestingly enough, and and everyone has it, and I think there's a coming of age film, and so there's some film for certain people that you know whether it was dirty dancing or whether it was raiders of the lost ark or, mm. well for some this little film uh, about 
called the Bermuda Depths with Burl Ives, Carl Weathers, Connie Selica, yep. and myself. Awesome. Um, uh, made with um, a, a, Tommy, to, a Japanese company who did the special effects, uh, and it was about a giant 50-foot turtle. Well, this film has has a lot of relevance for this this group of people. So it has this interesting sort of um, uh, cult, I guess, uh, uh, status, and has a lot of metaphorical, uh, sort of magical elements for people. And I love that because to me, that's what storytelling is trying to do. It's not mm -hmm. to say this is, you know, but, but there are different for different people, different books, different, different stories. And I really enjoyed it. I, I was flown back to New York uh, because I was asked to do it. I had done Alexander and they called and asked uh, me to do it. And, um, uh, but they wanted me to audition uh, and help select the, the lead the female lead, uh, and, and it was Connie Selick. I thought she was wonderful, and we became very good friends. And then uh, she went on to a really a, a very respectable acting career, became quite a quite an accomplished actor, um, and, and good people, too. We, we'd lost contact, as one does. But, but uh, yeah, we shot down in Bermuda um, and uh, shot on an old tub, essentially, uh, out in pursuit. And because, of course, the, the story really is that, Pretty much mo the story of Moby Dick, and uh, but I played a very, a very troubled young man. I mean, I, I was not I was not happy in it. I wasn't playing a type of I was I was sort of a not necessarily an antihero, but um, I had I had lost my parents to this turtle. I had fallen in love with a, a, a girl, a little girl who is essentially the phantom Jenny who returns, and um, and we fall in love again, but then she just it, it, it just goes on, and I. I, uh, um, but I, I remember the filming of it and I, I uh, we, we worked and worked and worked. I saw very little of uh, sort of the tourist Bermuda, but I still remember a lot of the, just the energy of the place, energy of the film. And I remember that it is so hot there that I would sweat, literally if I had a light blue shirt on and we did a tracking shot, by the time I walked, let's say the length of a building, my light blue shirt would be dark blue. <laughs> it was, so I said, no, 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 I have to sweat through everything. Then we shot, shoot, <laughs> so very hot. And you were the first person that I've talked to that was on um, Buck Rogers. Yeah, you know, that, that, uh, that was fun. Um, uh, Trisha Noble, who was also on Executive Suite, was on that with, with me. She played my the evil side of my my cohort. We were after the Danubian moon crystals, and Trisha passed away recently. But she was, oh, she was a sweet lady. She really was a kind person. Um, and uh, but then um, it was uh, Dorothy Stratton, and I, you know, one never knows if people know the yeah. story because you don't. But but she was she was uh, unfortunately. Uh, about three weeks after the show, she was she was uh, murdered by her then uh, estranged boyfriend. Yep. And um, but Dorothy was very sweet. Dorothy was it was very uh, it was it was it was an interesting thing because uh, with her, uh, I still remember I walked on the set and and um, a, a girl said hi and I went hi, and I walked past and. She had one of those faces that that with makeup could look like anything, mm -hmm. and without makeup, it was not like you didn't go, oh, it's Dorothy. It was a very interesting um, uh, capacity, like a chameleon that she had, and uh, but again, a really lovely person, and certainly deserved better than she got. You know, it was uh, it was it was one of those every you know the, if you if you 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 uh, spend time. Uh, and just certain th unthinkable things happened, and, and unfortunately, it happened to her. But uh, it was it was still fun to play. You know, I had a mustache at the time. I'd just done Inferno, and so I, you know, I got to eat the scenery. What can I say? That's cool. That I didn't I didn't know until now that your episode was with her because I just when I talked to Joyce Heiser too. I mean, she was really good friends with Dorothy, and they hung out all the time. Well, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's it it. Yeah, it's just you just like a lot of things. You you just think how tragic. Hmm. So I do. Uh, obviously, Inferno is such a you know has got a big following, and 
Um, what was it like working with uh, Argento? You know, it was interesting. Um, I, I'll start from what he said at the end. He said, Lee, you're the only American actor I, I, I want to work with again. Oh. And, and, and what was interesting was that he and I, because I'm also an artist, and, and he just spoke very little, um, very little English, and I had very little Italian. But I drew. And I didn't draw to be an artist. My dad was an artist. And he always said, when you can't talk about something, draw it, you know, paint it. Use your capacity not to try and impress people, but to really look at things, to, to take notes. And so, so he saw that I had this very vivid imagination. And I was fascinated with um, uh, uh, Sergio Franco, I think was his name, the, the, the designer because the, the level of alchemical perception of the use of colors of green, of blue, the lighting was, was really quite remarkable, as were the, the special effects. They were quite realistic, uh, quite disturbing, uh, but, but uh, I, I was fascinated in that. And I was also studying esotericism. I was very interested in related subjects. So when Dario and I would talk, I had different questions than uh, others and we would talk about other things and then Claudio his brother who spoke perfect English a lot of times would translate um, and you know the the funny thing was though I, I remember the last day of shooting on that that uh, w which was all the stunts which was all the fire and oh. uh, they said Lee uh, you're, you're, uh, you're, your stuntman he broke, he broke his leg um, would you could you don't worry it's, it's very safe it's very safe so don't worry can you do, could you do it, do you think? <laughs> Being a young, reckless actor, I thought, sure, how hard could that be? It's kind of the byproduct, but one of that, that sort of that, that how hard could that be, I think has been a call in my life. Life has responded, just wait. Uh, because uh, they, uh, first of all, the, the, where the beams, they go, Lee, um, okay, now uh, you'll come to the glass doors, big glass doors, they'll blow up right behind you. And then this beam will fall and the floor will crack, it will crash, and then you jump. And then, then this, the, the, you know, this being, this, this death figure will come out. And then, then you know, the, the, the fires will... Well, I realized that a lot of stunt work, because when those doors blew out, and also when they said, oh, Lee, it's very safe, I kid you not, I did a cartoon of this. There was uh, a pain, you know, thick panes of plexiglass sandbags everyone had hard hats and goggles on <laughs> and i'm the schnook out there going uh they told me this was safe um, so uh so i ready said action go when the doors blew out i felt this burst of, of energy behind me that really like like a hurricane just pushed me out the door uh hurtled me into the the process the beams fall they set the place on fire um, which, which, and finally, I, I, I get to the other side, and I realize that 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 stunt work is primarily uh, survival instinct uh, because you don't have time to think about anything. Uh, and the the gauntlet here was a bit longer than I had thought, uh, so I, I was kind of proud of, of it. But but the fire was a problem because they weren't prepared for fire, and it was like something out of a, a Keystone Cops movie. These two old Italians with the, the, the hats, the mustaches, and literally a water carriage, you know, a pump carriage mm -hmm. on, on, on cartwheels comes in and they're running around with this ancient piece of equipment as the walls go up. And ironically, as you know, the name of the movie is called Inferno. And oftentimes you don't want the, the participants to live up to the, the, the name. Um, uh, no inferno for the, the cast and crew. They finally got it out, but it it was it 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 really uh, 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 it it was it was one of those learning curves of of when you're done with principal photography. If you're a young actor and they say, "Do you want to do your stunts?" Don't worry, you might want to take a second look. <laughs> you might want to walk it out with them before you go. Yeah, sure, I'll do that. Uh, but, but I did, I, I enjoyed uh, and I learned a lot also because in Italy, especially making a film then, you did secondary sound. So it wasn't primary. So they could be building a set, they could be, you know, and, and it could be noisy. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and so 
because you go into the the looping studio or the sound studio after the, the, yep. the film, and then you do the dialogue. And that's when I realized I had to stop doing uh, Bob Newhart, who was a I don't know if you know him, but he would you know I I, I think this is uh, well I uh, uh, yeah. yeah when you're just, you're not actually saying words, you're sort of between words. And, and I, I found that having to loop every single take and to have to do that uh, made me actually made, make my, my um, delivery of, of, a, of a speech a bit more clean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no Jimmy Stewart hemming and hawing. <laughs> yeah. And was that a, uh, kind of any kind of more of a unique audition process to get that role in, the, in an Inferno too. You know, again, it was very um, Herb Wallerstein who um, came to a very sad end. Um, uh, he was the head of production at 20th Century Fox, and James Wood uh, was slated to do the role. Oh, but um, I, I don't know exactly what the the problem was, but but he fell out. And they had to, it was sort of the story of my career. I was, I was like the replacement actor, you know, <laughs> get Lee McCloskey. Um, and uh, so Herb had me come uh, uh, meet with them over at 20th. And um, I don't remember auditioning. It was just, it was more of, of uh, a conversation with Dario and Claudio, his brother, and then talking about the, the film and uh, then finding myself, uh, you know, essentially uh, off and doing it. So I, but it was, it was uh, again, replacing uh, um, uh, James Woods in that, in that part, which would have been a very different film. It's very interesting to think of what actor plays, what part, you know, I've, I've always been interested in that. When you think of like, you find out, oh, they were up for the role too. You always think, well, what would that have, what would right. that have looked like? Yeah, yeah. And what did you what did you think of your performance in it after you saw it when it came out? Well, you know, it was interesting. I I wish I had. This was the problem with um, Dario gave me a direction that I I wish I had been able to see dailies because oh. um, he he what was he said he said I want to like you're stuck in a dream like you can't quite figure out you're almost like like you're almost you're like in a bit of a fog mm -hmm. and and I, I played that i gave that but i i feel that you know looking looking at it there are things that that i i felt uh might have been more nuanced had uh you know had i had i been watching the you know through the dailies i might have done things a bit differently but i you know but for what it was uh, because it w is such a mysterious thing, and that the, the 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 key to Dario is that that he really is constructing a type of inner, um, almost nightmarish uh, scenario that it's supposed to have these odd characters that don't actually come fully into the the human, but just a strange, you know, they're they're visitors in their own way, you, you know. So there's there's an oddness to his filmmaking, and uh, so. Uh, you know, I, I don't really know how to answer that other than to say uh, it could have been a different performance, but the suggestion on the part of Dario um, was what I was really trying to trying to do. Okay. Because I knew he was a very visual director. And after that would have been uh, your appearance on The Fall Guy? Oh, yeah, Lee Majors. That's right. And, um, oh my gosh, hang, uh, what was his name? Um, oh, oh! I'm just blanking on the name of the country western star. Uh, uh, I'm just a kitten on a string. Oh, he played my dad. We were country western singers. I still remember. And uh, uh, about much more than that, I I don't. Uh, oh, I remember. That's right. Uh, Daniels, uh, um, Charlie Daniels played. I remember oh. that. Huh. And boy, that is like standing next to lightning. <laughs> <laughs> so that was great that was there are some perks sometimes you get to be live with certain performers you go i'm standing here on stage with them so uh that was that was cool but uh um yeah i don't and then i think was was 
I think it was Jim McMullen was in that. My friend Jim McMullen was in that with me. I, you know, it's so funny. I, I find that you reach a point where uh, it, it's a bit like a collage. And, and as we know with memory, certain things start to come up because you're thinking about them. And other times you, you wonder whether uh, you might just be, uh, what do they call it? Um, uh, inventing a memory. <laughs> so so this, is, this is the truth as far as I can remember it. Okay. <laughs> And since um, obviously Tanya Roberts just passed away, and you were in uh, her, you were in Hearts and Armor with her, did you have any specific memory with her? Yeah, I, I first of all, she looked like a, a painting by Botticelli. She had this extraordinary look, mm-hmm. and she was, but she was a girl from Brooklyn, yep. so she had this juxtaposition of hello. <laughs> of I don't want to, um, I'll insult people from Brooklyn if I do a Brooklyn accent without hearing it first. Um, but but she uh, she was. I really liked Tanya. I found her uh, to be uh, just a you know like like a very regular person uh, who in, who enjoyed herself, uh, especially in those days. And I have to say that uh, some of the locations we had and some of the costumes and. Uh, were quite wonderful. So uh, uh, it's nice because essentially that's that's where my my when I think of Tanya, that's really where I see her. I see her uh, with this long red hair, you know, on, on the horseback. You know, it's such a romantic uh, uh, image that was created in Hearts and Armor. Hearts and Armor. Yeah. So she, but well, bless you, Tanya, wherever you are. Is all I can say. She was she was good people. You're also, uh, you have to be on multiple episodes of The Love Boat. Yeah, I was, I was lucky because uh, I was able to go somewhere. You know, I did, the last one I did was actually at a studio. But uh, the first one, we went to the Greek Isles, which was wonderful. Wow. And, uh, um, uh, and it was, I mean, there was, there was such, there was an amazing group of people. Everyone from Gene Kelly and Polly Bergen, Mike Connors and and Harvey Corman and uh, 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 Lorenzo Lamas and I'm just trying to think of we had uh, uh, Billy Moses or William Moses and um, oh we had uh, Parker Stevenson all uh, just a just a group of of people that that had a great deal of fun and there were there were other older actors from the golden days as well that uh, really knew how to drink and, and, uh, and, uh, and party. And I remember uh, Debbie Allen um, uh, was, was on board and my wife, uh, Carla, was pregnant with our first daughter, uh, Caitlin. And so um, she'd go back and then Debbie Allen and I uh, 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 would dance. And um, the greatest compliment she ever said, she said, you, you uh, you you move much better than most white boys. So I thought, thanks, <laughs> Ellen. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, the uh, but but it was it was a, it was just a fun group of people. And, and I remember Doug Kramer, the uh, the producer who had also been the producer on Alexander and Dawn. He um, uh, he wrote a note to all of us saying, uh, "We appreciate that all of you are having so much fun, but it's beginning to show up on screen." Yes. And the problem is, a cruise ship like smorgasbord, and the food is like out of this world, and then an open bar to the acting profession is not really how you're going to do anything other than put people. Uh, they're going to really have to diet, and uh, but people, people, people shaped up. But it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, and yeah, we went to uh, where was it? Uh, Mykonos, uh, Santorini. Went to. Uh, uh, Samos and uh, actually went to, to Greece and uh, then to Ephesus and Turkey. And it's just fun because when you're with a, with a, a crazy group of people that, that are used to being, let's say, slightly outrageous, uh, you, you do a lot of laughing. And mm-hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, and of a gentle sort. It's not at people's expenses. It's just um, um, even I'm trying to, oh my God, there was just so many people on that cruise. And then, then we went to Hong Kong. I remember we did another one uh, in Hong Kong and um, that was fun. I, my, my, my remembrance of Hong Kong is that, that I saved lots of money buying things for a lot less 
that when I got home, I realized I never would have bought oh. here. <laughs> I saved, why did I buy this? <laughs> well, you got a great deal. What am I going to do with it? Type of thing. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, and that, that, uh, that was, um, yeah, again, that was Doug Kramer and uh, Aaron Spelling, right? They were, yep. they did the Fantasy Islands and the Love Boats and did a lot of those. And that, as I said, we went from the 70s of, of sort of challenging topics to uh, Fantasy Island and Love Boat and pastel colors and more innocuous uh, uh, stories, I guess. Mm -hmm. And with how long you were um, on Dallas and how big of a role you had, did you, was doing soap opera, soap opera in comparison to TV and film, was that something that you took to easily or was it difficult? You know, I, I really didn't know what it would be. And especially my generation had a very different sense of the, you don't sort of mix and match. You know, if you do one thing, you don't do that. Like mm -hmm. we did television, we did movies, we did TV, you didn't do daytime. You know, it was like, and that really evaporated, you know, the, that sort of uh, boundary between things. And, and I, I never really had spent any time because I didn't watch daytime and I didn't know what it was. And I had a fairly arch sense of what it probably was, which is, oh, Henry, I love you so much. Shut up, Gwendolyn. You know, that type of like over the top, who cares, you know, quit emoting so much type of thing. And then, then during the writer's strike, I think this was in... Um, the about 87 i guess um and just nothing was going on there was a uh um, barbara clayman who cast the show santa barbara which i i didn't know about yep. um uh, asked me to to come in on it and i did and i really um i, I just um i liked the people i i uh, i met a lifelong friend a martinez who is is a true brother uh, and the most one of the most noble beings I know with a true moral compass as a heart. Um, but I met, and I really, there were remarkable writers on the show when I came on. I mean, it just, they weren't writing, you know, a lot of daytime and a lot of soap opera is like opera. It's, it's you know, you're sort of disclamatory emotions, you know, you're you're hitting the nail on the head. Great writing is never saying what is actually going on. It's always, in a sense, resisting what's actually going on, which makes it more interesting to watch, more interesting to, to play, because it's more complex. Mm -hmm. And they, they were able to create these, the, you know, I thought, and, and I just found the writing, and then with Marcy Walker, uh, um, uh, uh, Terry Lester, uh, Lane Davies, uh, Nancy Graham, there were people that in any you know, whether it was on stage, whether it was in the film, I mean, they would be able to give great performances because their instrument was such. They just happened to be working in this medium. And mm -hmm. that freed me a lot, you know, because they said it was like, oh, wait a minute. It's much more like a quick sketch, but that doesn't mean you can't, you know, in a sense, you can't do this and still paint. Yeah. It just means look at the demands. And I really started enjoying it because, you know, the memory demands were a lot. Like some. Sometimes, you'd, you know, you'd have up to like seven scenes, it was like 40 pages, 45 pages of dialogue. And a lot of the dialogue is fairly similar. So you have to figure out, well, how do you actually memorize and find hinges? How, do, how does it, and, and a lot of it cultivated to me what I realized were old memory tricks, uh, really going back to the Greeks, meaning that, that this is a, a muscle. You know, the memory really is a type of mechanism. Mm -hmm. And we usually leave these things unchallenged, but because of the challenge of that medium, you, you, your process has to be activated. You know, in other words, you have to be very present. You really have to listen. Yeah. And what I like is there's no safety net. You know, it's going to go, whether it goes good or ill, it's not like, can I have another one? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's in the can. So I liked working that way. I liked sort of the, the sense of, of, you know, just, being more alert of of that and then and then um so so i i found it was a it was a medium i could thrive in you know and i began to understand i i actually think some of my best performances were uh on that medium I, because i was able to because of the writing because they're not in a hurry right they're not trying to contain in a in a scene a lifetime of meaning they're saying, oh, well, we'll, you know, and, and that's why you can tune in three weeks later and the character is still going, what am I going to do? Um, but 
for the actor, it's 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 a different type of thing. It's almost like a, a, a tide where if you use it a bit like a meditation, you're able to just examine uh, human behavior. That's one of the things in why for me, I've always loved acting was it lets me step into another mind and see the world, uh, not how I would see it, but really through the lens of how they add the world up. And I, and I simplified that. I started thinking a character like we are, every, everyone is based on I am this and I am not this. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and if you shift those magnets, you know, I am this. and I, It's not, you're no longer just saying what you are as a person. This is one, why acting also teaches non-judgment. Like I've played a lot of villains and you realize if you judge the villain or you hate the villain, you can't step inside. You have to say, no, no, no. Right. And that's why I often say that in my work that I realized that the villain of the piece is the one that can't change. You know, when I played Damien Smith, I, I realized that, that uh, for him, he could not afford to love. It made him weak. His father had taught him that. Don't be vulnerable. If you love, you're a sucker. But he hated people that could love because he thought they were weak. So he felt it was to him to try and bribe them to, in a sense, find their price to say, you say you're moral and upright. I'm just interested in that you're effective. I'm going to find your price. Everybody has one. You know, and, and, but that character taught me really that I, cause I'm a nice guy and I, you know, and I say this to nice guys, you're probably a nice guy, Chris, <laughs> that the difference between a good guy and a nice guy is a nice guy is nice because he doesn't want to deal with something. A good guy is direct. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, he, you know, and a lot of times we only give that to the bad guy who says, you're a blah, 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 as opposed to going, no, the nice guy has to be the good guy, meaning I need this from you rather than. Or, or shape up or whatever it is, you know, that type of thing. So all of the characters have taught me, me, me different things in, in an interesting way. They've, they've uh, sort of broadened my appreciation for just, just how different people are and why we all come from such different places, you know. And then that's why conversation rather than debate. And that's why I like theater, because you start to see the play and you think that it's not the one character, but how all of them help shape a, you know, a, a greater story. And that's really where I've reached is this sense of all of these characters now are able to be and almost constellated as different beings that um, like different masks are, are saying we wear many, many masks and are capable of being all these different things. But essentially, unless we become lost in them, we're always ourselves. And that's, that's why I like theater. And I always think it would be great if we could teach not people to become actors, but more like role playing in school, you know, where you'd actually have forms where kids could step into these roles and realize if you play the role, you're not as undone by it. You know, you're not, again, like a mask, you're able to explore different characters. Yep. And this is kind of a general question I like to ask anybody that does on camera um, back then in the 70s and 80s, did you ever get to audition or come close to being a part of any film that was really iconic or that went on to be really iconic or major or anything? Yeah, um, I actually had the great fortune uh, to audition for Francis Ford Coppola for, I think it was Rumblefish. Oh, yeah. And, and, um, uh, and it was Kevin... Uh, Matt Dillon, no, no, uh, yeah, Matt Dillon, who who played um, who played the role, did a brilliant job. Um, but Coppola really uh, astounded me because he spent probably close to three hours with me, and he would he 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 uh, he saw that I was very malleable, and he was out he was having me do it all different ways, and I just loved how he was he was like a painter probing a subject, you know, like like well put your arm like no what if you and and I just I just really admire I also admired that he was so gracious, mm -hmm. you know, and that he was so interested that he wasn't just rushing through because I had other directors that were like looking at their watch and you know I didn't really feel like oh well sorry I interrupted your coffee type of thing um, but he was he was just uh, uh, not simply a gentleman but an artist I mean like like you could see him he had a type of focus it was interesting I was invited. Uh, to a to a friend's house. Um, uh, actually, Barbara Streisand was there. Oh, and we had a conversation, and she had that same type of concentration. 
you know, like an, I could only call it an absorbent concentration. Like when another being is really interested in you, but like almost like you're some type of, you know, flower, you know, they're trying to figure out what you're made of, mm. which is very interesting because it's, it's a type of uh, almost um, just, a, just a curiosity that's very, 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 uh, very powerful in, the, in a few people I've run into. And those are two people that really have, have that, you know, because they take an interest in not what they assume they're looking at, but trying to get past what they assume. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I, I, so in a way you learn a lot from those type of people too, you know, how to, how to see. Uh, and um, yeah, so he was, he was great. Um, I, I, my, my, in a way, the, the one that I, I uh, wish had gone uh, differently was I, I had met um, Richard Rush and uh, Dick Rush. And he was a wonderful director. He did um, with Peter O'Toole, who was a, 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 just a, you say, a hero of mine when I was a young actor, um, in a movie called The Stuntman that uh, actually Steve Railsback uh, played the role. And um, uh, 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 Richard had wanted me to play the role. And, um, and uh, he called, uh, very sad, he said, he said uh, I'm really sorry, um, but my financing came in and it's a question of doing the film or not doing the film. And the original contract has Steve Rails back, who I think will do a fine job, uh, but I, we, can't, we can't do this. And, and I, I um, uh, you know, that, that, would, that would be interesting. There were certain pivotal things like George Cukor, uh, Richard Rush, where you realize, uh, and even The Princess Bride, I remember Rob Reiner, who is a, just a, a noble soul. He, uh, uh, he looked at me after I, I, uh, the, the role that Carrie always played. And I would have loved to have done Princess Bride. I read the book and I read, the, you know, the, yeah. all the, you know, those things. And um, uh, he, he looked at me and goes, God, you you're a really good actor. You must you must work all the time. <laughs> and I almost wanted to say, yeah, but it's 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 films like this that you know the you know the opportunity to actually uh, do something of of uh, of lasting merit, um, you know. But but I, I uh, you know you realize that a lot of it is that, and it, it taught me a lot that. You know, I started to liken it that, that, that a career was a bit like, uh, you know, the great thing is, you know, there's, there's a river, so to speak, and you're invited to put your canoe in, and a lot of people don't even get to that. And, of course, you try and get out into the center current. You know, you keep leaning, trying to, but, but you know, things buffer. Things do happen that open certain doors. And then others just, no matter what you do, you're being pushed in another direction. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you, and you really don't know why. But I, I feel like part of it, um, you know, you learn in, a, in an acting career. I, I used to, I, I said that, you know, you learn that it's not personal. It's been like working for the mob, you know, Lee, we like you, kid, but we got to whack you. You know, it's like, and, and, and when you understand that, then you're not looking, uh, you know, the other thing was is thinking that, that it's everyone's sane. And I realized, no, everyone's mad. And essentially, when you realize that, you're not trying to convince people that they shouldn't be. You're starting to figure out, well, how do I navigate this? Because people don't necessarily make rational choices. They don't. Things come together for no particular reason. You know, how do you how do you uh, not take it personally? So a lot of my sort of inner yoga over the years has been developing, um, not a type of predestined sense, but really almost an appreciation of that everything is shaping us, you know, because I, 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 you know, I came up with actors that became very, very famous and actors who were extraordinarily talented, who had one shot at it, yep. you know, and didn't. So you kept thinking of the fickle finger of fate. What is that? You know, why? And, and I, and I really almost like life, you know, it's, it's sort of every, you know, everyone's a player, right? But, but I, you know, uh, you know, I, I really do think that, um, it's just every example of an acting career is sort of put out and somebody has to live the different examples. I would almost, I can see my, I actually can make parallels to my acting career, you know, meaning that I understand uh, where it in a sense evens out on what, what I did, what the opportunities were, what the types of movies I made were, 
you know, the, the level of, of directors I worked with, you know, you start to, you, but you're appreciative in the sense that, you know, you can always look at things for, they could have been greener, but uh, I really started to look very pragmatically at my, my acting career as a patron mm. that really did allow me to live in my home, uh, in, a, in a wonderful home that, uh, you know, I started having discussion groups because I, I realized that, that it wasn't up to Hollywood to satisfy my, my curiosity or creative need. It was a business. You know, it wasn't up to them to make relevant movies. You know, it was up to me, if things mattered, to actually create a place. And that was the gift I was given. You know, I was given an opportunity to use my home as a place for community, to say to people really for all walks of life, come to my home. Let's, let's have a conversation about the ideas and things that have either no place in the world or no time for them in the world. But like gardeners, let's actually cultivate it. And what I like about my life now is looking back as I recently turned 65, is you start to appreciate that, that the decisions you make to cultivate, not that which is for the world, but really for that which you love. Mm -hmm centers you over time in a different place you know it's no longer about the oh i wish i had worked with that director or you know could have done you know it's like it's just that's those are life memories what what is much more fulfilling then becomes uh i start to understand that in my recognizing discussion groups that my uh, life as an artist as an author started to emerge not to again convince the world my acting side had done that Do you know in other words you take your 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 pleasures and pains publicly as an actor which made me very protective of everything else in a way i quarantined uh my what was deeply important to me in that i didn't put it up for you know this worldly consideration what do you think and it taught me and this is why i was told artists, I tell people, creative people, I say, don't ask anyone what they think about your art. Ask them what your art makes them think. Mm -hmm. You know, because one's a critique, and, and everyone wants to offer their critique, and now everyone has so much self-critique, it's, you know, it's, it's hobbling. You know, people are so afraid of what will people say, and that's why a lot of my work, and a lot of the balance of the public life we're talking about, uh, it taught me to really hold a place where I could be private so that it would balance the public life and I would again navigate it but not take it personally so if it was very you know fertile great you know good harvest if not I'll do these other things and my whole philosophy has been in the meantime you know before these things happen before the you know and and I'm uh, you know I'm just I, I just think it's 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 um, it's turned out to show that that we are given certain things but that the balance is investing in the things that allow us to say the world doesn't care about these things, but I do. And right. maybe I can't convince my neighbor he should, but I do know there's a few of us that care about these things. And that's what I found over the years. There was always poor people that said, yeah, let's, let's ask these questions. You know, let's not debate, let's, let's inquire. And that's what I love about acting. It's about ensemble, about or jazz, right? Your instrument is excellent. I don't want to tell you how to play it. You know, I want to inspire you to play it. You know, let's go somewhere with it. And uh, but anyway, so so go on. What, what other questions did you did you? Well, since um, it's kind of related to that, but since you obviously had a phase where you were in um, a lot of teen movies, I was just wondering if you did you ever get the opportunity to audition for anything that John Hughes did. You know, I think I ought, I might have, and I might again be inventing that. I might have auditioned for Fraternity uh, uh, House. The, uh, what is it? Yeah, House Fraternity. John Belushi, the Animal House. Oh, yeah. I think I, think I might have auditioned uh, for Animal House. It's interesting, James Naughton, who is in it, uh, uh, we're on Facebook. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a good guy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, but uh, the other ones, I, uh, you know, I really, I, I'm not sure. What was your, uh, was it fun being on just one of the guys? 
You know, it's funny. Um, I, I had I finished, um, uh, I was in Palm Springs uh, doing a fraternity vacation. And they flew me uh, into, I think it was Phoenix. Or, yeah. And to, to join the cast. And it was interesting coming in uh, because I, again, a bit like where you come on something, you feel a bit like a, a little bit like an outsider. You think, mm, okay. Uh, and then, you know, certain people rehearse and they leave their dark glasses on and you think, I think I'd like to see your eyes. And, um, and there was a lot of attitude from the young actors. And I started, it was funny. They weren't that much younger than me, but I started feeling like the old man on the set going, kids, don't get into this hubris thing. <laughs> Don't start thinking you're too big for your britches and start signing contracts you don't have yet, you know. And and um, uh, and it w- it was interesting. It it because certain sets have different vibes, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and the people on them had and and the, there was an, there was an odd entitlement on that set that I did take a couple of the younger actors aside and just, um, you know, basically have that conversation about, about uh, this is not something you're doing alone here. You know, <laughs> how you're treating me matters, how you're treating somebody else matters. And I, and that's part, part of my work has become, I haven't talked about it, the etiquette of energy, you know, basically um, as a director with actors, it's, uh, you know, it's a matter of how you treat somebody. If she's somebody right, you can get anything out of them. You know, and uh, so I, you know, but other, but other than that, I, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the desert. Um, I, I enjoyed uh, Joyce. I'm trying to think of, and then I, I, I Cheryl Lee, I thought some of the people that, um, who was the young guy? He was great. Uh, I forget his name. Billy Jan. Yeah, he was the younger brother, I think. He was yeah. the, yeah, he was great. He was just, and then I liked, um, I liked Zach, Zachary. I liked I like a lot of them and a lot of them most of them were great so I don't mean to make a sweeping uh, mm-hmm. there were a couple of people that I I talked to I don't because I, I realized I sort of couched that in a negative and you know like everything most most of the time most people are pretty cool and uh, every now and then you run into an actor with um, sometimes with uh, uh, um, you know in the seventies I took an actress aside and said I. I, you have to you have to save your partying until after we're done shooting. When I look in your eyes, all I see is this. I said it's it's showing on camera, and uh, just just a precautionary note, you know, sort of also watching out, you know, don't don't, you, you know, there there are a lot of eyes on you in this industry, so don't 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 be behaving in certain ways, um, you know, you really you just you try and pass that along. I think it's interesting that you mentioned uh reading for princess bride because i could definitely see you being up against roles that you know carrie elwes and like william hurt people like that would have ended up getting because you guys kind of had the same look yeah exactly no it's it's it, that's why you start to think that uh, it, it was funny I, I had an experience with this i sat with an actor i uh, forget his name but, but he looked a lot like me and it was funny thing was we were at an audition and we both decided to dress very similar and then we start talking, and he said he married an assistant director. And I did, too. And then he tells me he has two daughters. I do, too. Same age. And I started thinking, maybe this, you know, maybe we're like geraniums, and because I'm over here and this one's over here, I think I'm the geranium. You know, I'm, but really, we're, we're connected in very strange cookie-cutter ways, you know, like roles, really, like uh, that, that the, the same sort of uh, elements are put into, well, what if we put it over here? What if we put it over here? like seeds of a plant, it would grow differently, but it'd have the same basic ingredients. And uh, that, was a, that was a very funny experience going, well, I feel unique and original after that experience. <laughs> How many more me's are there out there? <laughs> what, was your, what was your personal experience being on uh, Murder, She Wrote too? Angela Lansbury was, uh, I think she's still alive. Uh, she, she was, what a noble heart, what a kind woman, what a thoughtful professional, truly set a high tone. Uh, you know, that, that she, she was, 
she was a very, very special uh, actor and had a special history as an actor. I mean, it was something that you look at and you think, my God, gaslight. You go back and start to look through her career and you realize she had acted with everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, she, she had not only acted, she won the Academy Awards. I mean, she was, she was such a... Uh, and in that, it was a bit like Carl Malden. There are just certain beings that have gravitas. You know, they carry their history with them. And the thing is, there are those that carry their history with them and advertise it, and that's not interesting. There are those, though, that just, in a way, are showing up for work one more day. You know, they're not a big attitude about who they are. They just carry it with them. And she set the tone. Everyone um, uh, was, uh, and I can't mention his name, but there was there was one actor that, uh, and we all run into them, that, that just... You know, they're walking. They're, they're, they're the smartest person in the room. They're the person that was denied the most opportunity. You know, in other words, they're. It's all about them. Mm-hmm. And 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 um, I remember Millie Perkins was on, and and Angela was sitting at the table. We're all having lunch, and uh, and uh, Millie Perkins goes, "God, I think he hates me." And I go, "I, I think he hates me." And the person next to me goes, "I I, I think he hates me too." <laughs> and then Angela Lansbury goes, "Oh." Thank goodness, I thought he only hated me. <laughs> so this one actor uh, really was, was uh, just a, a sour figure, but, but she was a, a delightful and by contrast, just such a noble professional. And I found that to be really true about uh, producers, that if the producers uh, uh, were cool, like when I did uh, Heart to Heart with uh, Robert Wagner, aren't you? Yep. He, uh, I, it, Ricardo Madabon, RJ, and A. Martinez. Uh, if I had to say, who are the three noblemen you met? It would be those three. And the interesting thing is that, that RJ, when we did Heart to Heart, was, there was, there was this just graciousness that exuded, you know, people trusting and being kind to each other. Mm-hmm. And then with other producers who were paranoid or always looking at the, um, that were not gracious. Everyone was looking over their shoulder. Everyone was tense. No one enjoyed the work. You know, the, the comments were, well, at least I'm getting overtime, <laughs> you know, rather than, and that's why really with Angela going back to her, who she was a producer, of course, and she just set the tone, you know, and I think that that's the job of, uh, if you wanted to, I, like, I've always loved directors that realize that, that people are nervous and you just put them at peace and they'll do the best they can for you. Mm-hmm. And uh, since I'm, I'm not sure if this is kind of like a rumor that I like to ask different actors to, depending on how long they've been around, uh, did you ever get the opportunity to audition for either of the Grease movies? No, no, okay. I didn't. I did. No, no. No, I, hmm, no. <laughs> Good, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess this is going off of what you just said too, but if you're able to talk about it, is there any experience on set for like back then that was overtly negative or was there anything that was like, you know, anything that was like that bad for you or did it get that bad? No, I, I, I don't, you know, I've thought about that because people have some, you know, horror stories, casting couch stories and, you know, I started to look at my career and I realized that, that uh, first of all, um, Carl and I um, uh, really, with her as an assistant director and me as an actor, uh, we decided to, uh, you know, really make our relationship the primary relationship, that our professional decisions would be based on our relationship. So when she would work, I would go with her if she was doing, like, let's say, uh, Harvest Home and, and is Ohio. I came from Bermuda up to there, but then she went to Jurassic Park and she's over in Kauai and came to visit her there. You know, so she was, uh, she would travel and then I would go with her and take care of the kids. And then she, I would travel and she would take care of the kids. So we would balance really our home as the primary uh, point of focus and our uh, professional decisions based around um, one another, because one of the things you realize is that when you're on location and that, that you're really in a false, you know, sort of friendships because you have to be, and everyone's, you know, the creative, the funny, you know, 
so so there's a there's a freedom that's not really dealing with everyday life so you really don't have sort of the everyday relationship uh and it can be a bit like like uh, falling in love with a dream mm -hmm. and and so knowing this i think that we you know because it wasn't something big it wasn't like oh this will but it really did uh create a, a gravity for us that I really feel life was able to fall into place based upon these very strong decisions on our part. And as a matter of fact, when um, in the DGA, when uh, our daughters were born, Carla uh, for the DGA, because she's a pioneer in, in women in film, she, uh, she actually ended up, uh, she directed Gilmore Girls and she ended up a uh, 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 unit production manager and, uh, first AD worked with Spielberg and, oh. and Richard Rush. She worked with um, um, uh, Christopher Columbus. She worked with all of these really, uh, you know, just uh, important directors. Uh, Dante, Joe Dante. She did, you know, she did um, uh, The Burbs with Tom Hanks. And mm -hmm. so she was, I, I used to joke, I say, you're getting to work with all the people I want to work with. But she, she figured out how to job share, how to uh, be able to, because otherwise you have no life at all. And as a mother, how to be able to uh, work, and this had to be on when she did uh, Ali McBeal um, uh, or before that, she figured out how to plan a show, be off a week, do the show, do you know, in other words, to stagger so that the mother uh, could be with her baby. And, and it really, uh, and so that, uh, those demands created a, a, a creative change that affected um, really the, the, the industry um for the better uh because that's always the question and how does one make film and still have a family life mm -hmm. and carla and i knowing that really that's what we have always done and that's why also with my discussion groups in my home as i realized the counterbalance in my life was always that sense of well let us value these things you know rather than running after the world please value these things yep. because that exhausts people you know trying to convince others since you started at the same time as um, people like Michelle Pfeiffer and John Travolta and Deborah Winger, did you ever see any of them when they were just starting out too, or no? Yeah, I actually, I, I auditioned for, um, oh, what was, it was an awful, 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 awful film um, uh, with John Travolta. It was, and, and who was the, it was a disco film. It was like like dancing, um, and it did not turn out well. Let's put it. So I wasn't I wasn't sad that I didn't get the part, but again, uh, I I remember you just reminded me. I forgot. I my I uh, the producer and uh, and John were in in an office, and I sat and uh, um, the director was a was a very interesting director too. I sh I should remember, but. But we had really a marvelous uh, conversation. Just, mm -hmm. just, you know, just talked, and uh, it didn't come to anything. But again, a bit like Barbara Streisand and Coppola, I found uh, John Travolta had that type of almost thirsty eyes, like really interested. You know, not not like like sort of full of attitude, but much more full of curiosity. He he really uh, and and um, I remember I really just very much liked him, and I thought he was very again very gracious. And and very enthusiastic. I'm, I'm I'm very enthusiastic as well. So there's that feeling of yeah, you know, when you're excited about a project, you you know, you can you can uh, uh, really it just it's it's a bit like being a jazz band leader. You just want to inspire everybody. So he was he had that that uh, sort of enthusiasm, that 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 quality. Um, but so then I'm trying to think of who. Um, Deborah, I, I remember we were in an office together, but we, you know, it was like Nancy Allen and I, we sat next to each other type of thing. Oh. <laughs> we actually you know, probably said, hi, how are you doing? You know, a uh, lot of traffic today type of thing. So nothing, nothing deep. Um, um, and then um, a lot of, well, as I said, Carla worked with uh, Dennis Quaid uh, and Meg Ryan on um, Innerscape. Inner, um, Innerscape, what was the, it was, with Short, uh, uh, Martin Short. Oh yeah. Um, I want to say Innerscape or Dream or something. But she, so she worked with a lot of those, uh, the young up and coming actors as well that ended up uh, like Tom Hanks. Uh, yeah. 
carving out quite a quite a name for himself. But uh, um, the time I spent with you know saying hello with him, uh, he's uh, Carlos wears him too. He's a very generous man, good man. And uh, my time with Dustin Hoffman, I, I sat next to a, uh, next to him because he was in Hook with my uh -huh. old mate and, and friend uh, Robin Williams. So Carla was the AD on Hook. And, uh, um, and uh, I remember Dustin and I talked about, uh, he'd done a series on artists. So we talked about that. But uh, that's interesting. It's sort of a pastiche of memory. And it was great for Robin. Did you say that you lived with Robin Williams for? Yeah, he, he was actually a classmate at Juilliard. We, we went oh. to Juilliard, we were classmates. And um, uh, yeah, he played, uh, of course, Peter Pan in Hook. And I hadn't seen, and and uh, it was great. So he worked with Carla, and uh, we were old, old friends. That uh, uh, we spent a lot of time in school days having very serious conversations about very deep subjects. You would not have thought of him as a comedian, <laughs> but more as, as an angst, <laughs> really getting at the heart of things. And we all thought, you know, we all loved Robin. Uh, you know, you go out and perform in the park, do mime in the park when we were all students, and and I still remember. A conversation where everyone said, "Oh God, he's so funny!" But do you think he'll ever catch on? I mean, he's just—you know—he's so offbeat, he's so off the wall. Little did we know, he wouldn't just catch on; he would uh, catch fire. But uh, mm -hmm. what a genius! What a—I I actually, in my studio, have a rose that I uh, call it Robin's Rose. I—I uh, I wrote something and I, I put the rose to honor the passing of my friend in the studio, and the rose never wilted, nor oh. have. So it's called Robin's Rose. It's about really this, this life that he gave us that will never wilt, it'll never die. It was a gift, you know? And uh, boy, the world sorely misses its fool because I really thought he was truly in the best, you know, in the traditional sense of the fool, the one that was willing to scoff at the king and make us laugh along with him. So, miss you, Robin. That's still honor him every, uh, every August though, so. And since you've mentioned Nancy Allen too, the mates has made me think, uh, did you ever get to audition for anything that Brian De Palma directed? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, Fury, The Fury. And, oh yeah. Uh, um, I, uh, again, I had a very, a long, um, uh, the first time I auditioned for De Palma was for yeah, I think it was the Fury and and Andrew Stevens, who again being very similar to me, was yeah. cast. Um, uh, and and I and I don't know why he went that direction. I mean, Andrew's great. I don't mean anything personal about that, but but uh, but because we had a very good uh, you know audition. I still remember it. again. It was it, he was an interesting director. I auditioned for him again for something, and. I, it was like a different man. He was on the phone. He was looking at his paper. He was, you know, it was almost like, you know, he could have said, I'm not right when I walked in the door <laughs> rather than, you know, it was almost like, because you remember the first time you think, oh, well, and then the second time is completely different. But uh, yeah, De Palma, the first time, so I'll go with that version of him, was really quite a, quite an interesting director. Asked different, you know, asked for different things. And uh, it would have been great. I would have loved to have done that. And so in the, in the 90s, do you have a particular favorite um, project that you got to be a part of? You know, I, I would say that from the uh, looking at the 90s where I was able to do some of the best work was in the beginning of the character of, of Damien Smith in General Hospital. Okay. He was he was a gangster's son. What's very interesting to me was I modeled him uh, after Donald Trump at the time, oh, because I looked around, you know, because this this guy was the tempter, right? He he was the one saying, "Listen, everyone has a price. I don't believe in love. I believe in success. Are you a winner or are you a loser? Are you on my team or not on my team?" You know, this was really what he was like. And I and I thought, all right, so I, you know, and I thought, well, who does the culture venerate as as you know what people want? He lives in the penthouse, you know this. Because this character was, was really uh, uh, what it was almost like going to work and playing my shadow, playing literally my opposite. Everything he valued, 
I, you know, in a way he would look at, let's say me and think I would do, you know, like with art, right? Why, how can you make money at that? If you can't make money, why is it important? Why would you waste your time? Mm -hmm. The only thing that matters is what you have, who you know, what you can do. Because in a way he was about the path of power and in the path of power, any, any means to an end is justifiable. People are just pawns in a chess game. Get over your empathy, you know, and, and, and what was intriguing was that his art uh, and character were written with subtlety. It wasn't just arch villainy. It was more psychological villainy, which I really enjoy because you're not, this is why I, you know, I, 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 I joke even with my work that I did as, as an artist when I re spent 17 years uh, revisioning the major arcana of the tarot uh, with pen and ink drawings is they're called trumps. So there were 22 trumps. And I started to realize that, that the joke or the tongue in cheek, the theater with my understanding of things was that I started to understand life and experience as essentially a type of uh, greater theater of the human story. Meaning that if we like theater, take the characters too seriously, we're swept away by them. But if we understand how they trigger each other, like Damien, what I like to point out was because he could not love, he challenged those who could and said, if you love, is your love stronger than your greed? Because I will do everything to prove to you you're not who you think you are. But think of that as a tempter, right? As, as a being that says, uh, I'm, I'm not going to just be kind. I'm going, if, if, you, if you become a hero, it will become, be because of me. I'm the catalyst. You know, in other words, since you can't change me, you're going to have to change. You know, you're going to have to learn how to f no longer fight the way you used to. You're going to have to realize I'm not movable. And, and, that's, and it's an interesting thing to play the character because you, you then realize how this character is not just one person. It's, it's over and over again like in the theater of the world, like these characters, the villainous characters are always the ones that force us to change, if we think about it, you know? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> because you can't change them. They want you to take them on. That's, you know, in a way, that's my, then you enter my fight. And that's another thing that he taught me, you know, about, about how to control the argument, so to speak. Make them fight what you're, how you're defining things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't let them define. So characters teach you. So anyway, go on. I'm sorry. And more, well, more recently, I know one of the last things you did, uh, were you just asked to be on Bones? You know, Bones, I, yeah, I think so. I'm trying to think how that came about. That was, yeah, and it's funny because my work away from acting has been about myth and the study of religion and esotericism and traditions and folklore. And I played a guy on a show called Kill the Myth. And basically it was going to work a bit like Damien Smith and playing my opposite. I, I got to accuse everyone of, uh, of uh, I, you know, I was, I was just ruthless. I, I said, you know, basically... Uh, all of these uh, these so-called uh, creatures, like, I think it was the chupacabra, uh, mm -hmm. I was about, and I said, uh, you know, that that all of these things are fallacies, all myths are nonsense. So, so, but he got his comeuppance. He was killed by a chupacabra, or at least it looked like he was. But you'll have to watch Bones to find out. <laughs> I guess. Uh, well, yeah. I did, since the last thing that you were a part of is. You know, you were on The Young and the Restless until 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that uh, Jill, who had been Jill Phelps, Jill Farron Phelps, uh, Jill Farron, that's right, she's not Jill Farron now. Um, uh, she, uh, she, who, she had had me come to New York uh, to take a character off the air, which we were doing, is it One Life to Live? I get them confused. As, as uh, Drake, I think that was. Drake. And then, then she asked me to come back uh, to play um, the character I had played on uh, The Young and the Restless before, The mm -hmm. Doctor, and and I did. And um, you know, I, I think that 
uh, it bounced around and never like th there was a decision on the storyline and I can tell could tell when it happened where they decided to give the storyline to another actor who was a regular on the show. You know, and a lot of times these are financial decisions. You know what? We, we're paying him. What? You know, we'll, we can save money here. So I think it was it was basically, uh, but it was to play this this revisit this character. It was kind of fun to to do that uh, for a little bit. Um, you know, and and but it was more of the testing the grounds, um, and, and it never kind of got off the ground in that second mm -hmm. uh, incarnation. You know, so. And but it's all part of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I like to end every interview I do with just asking in terms of your career, um, what do you want your legacy to be? I would like my legacy to really be the relationship, not simply to acting or an acting career, but really a, a creative life, uh, not for others, but as a way of approaching one's questions about things um, that my movie career my acting career I, I know with my art now and I, I highly suggest that people take a moment if they can look at just Lee McCloskey art or Google or Lee McCloskey .com or Lee McCloskey YouTube channel because I've, I've done a lot of, of asking of questions with with paint and story and art because uh, I really feel and have felt driven by a type of Renaissance model. So my legacy will, I really hope to be, a Renaissance model of, uh, of approach to life, meaning that every question in life demands a different location. Like some questions I've asked needed to come from where I live, and this is my art. They needed to come from where I love, not where I'm trying to convince others or have ambitions for a career. But like a gardener, I can pay attention to these things. And for me, that's important. It's, it's, it's about a legacy of a life that achieved balance between a public life and a private life. And that finally the private life, like a garden, was able to become that, which is now being shared more and more publicly. And hopefully people will, who remember me as an actor, see that, that it wasn't just about acting. It wasn't about fame or celebrity. It was about a creative life that, in asking questions in different directions, ended up cultivating a lot of different um, uh, branches to this tree. But I, I really also want to say it inspirationally to young people and young actors and young artists and young musicians, is that you rush out, you have a gift that you want to share with the world and you think, oh, I love this so much, it'll, it'll matter. And then you find out it doesn't matter. And that the key after a while, even though it makes you very sad, is that you start to learn you must care. It must matter to you tenfold. And that don't use it to prove something, don't use it to debate with someone, but keep it private. If you journal, if you write, if you draw, don't do it to be an artist or to be a writer. Do it because it's from your heart. And I, and I feel profoundly now that it's about developing an intimacy or relationship with our inner self that says, Listen, like love, I'm not asking you to shout it to the world. I'm not asking you to make money with it. I'm just trying to get you to spend time with yourself in a way that says you're worth it, that you're not a mistake, mm -hmm. that you were given this difficult life because you are an art form. You're essential. And we're like here with the library, you're an essential book in the library. You know, and I, and I do feel that very strongly. So maybe that's my legacy is to to help us uh, remember that we're far more interesting and remarkable than we think. But as storytellers, and especially the story we tell ourselves, we have to begin asking more, in a sense, more interesting questions and be kinder to ourselves. You know, we've gotten really good at beating ourselves up. So it's like, chill. <laughs> That's what I get from my work now. It's like, take a breath, enjoy life, you know. Be strong, and you can if you, you know, trust who you are. That's the key to me. You know, that's my legacy, I guess. Well, he was said, said, told me to say yes rather than yikes. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. This was uh, insightful and really interesting for me. Good, Chris. Well, I, I thank you for reaching out, and uh, you know, I just wish you well, and uh, 
great success in all you do. And, uh, and really just remember, uh, and I'm glad you're doing this, is reaching out, seeing, asking questions, because that's the best way. I, I realized when I began work on my studio, The Hybrid with the Human Soul on 9-11-2001, mm. that the last flood was water. This flood is information. Yeah. And so the question is now, what do I pay attention to? You know, so just, I, I appreciate you paying attention to uh, these different, different parts of, uh, of our, our human story. And I just wanted to wish you well with yours. And uh, let's talk again at some point. Yeah, thanks.